we should all be millionaires. All right, ladies, I'm back. And today I'm really excited to share an interview with you with the Rachel Rogers. So listen, regardless if you have a business or not, I believe this conversation is really, really important for you to listen to. Money is a taboo subject. And I will tell you again and again, I meet so many powerful, driven, smart, ambitious women who use the excuse of parenting or life or COVID as the reason why they are not making money. And I am telling you right now, that is not the fucking reason. It is not the reason. We need to dig Deeper, we need to wake up to what is really going on. So, Rachel Rogers, the author of We Should All Be Millionaires, go check it out now. You can purchase anywhere online. Um, Support your local bookstore. Uh, The subtitle A Woman's Guide to Earning More, Building Wealth, and Gaining Economic Power. I'm going to read something off the back of her book. While 90% of the world's millionaires are men, only 10% are women, making it difficult for women to gain the economic power that will create lasting equality. Let me repeat that again. Only 10% are women, making it difficult for women to gain the economic power that will create lasting equality. Rachel Rogers, founder of Hello7, a company that coaches women in scaling their businesses and their lives to seven figure, says it's time for change. So Rachel is a woman of color, a mother of four, a seven figure business owner, um, and in that order. Rachel started her career working with a nonprofit, federal judges, and Hillary Clinton when she realized that changing the world is easier when you have some cash in your bank account, she decided to build a million dollar business and then teach other women how to do it. All right. I could go on and on and on about this. And I guess maybe you can hear some passion in my voice, but I can't tell you the illusion or the disillusion that we have as women of, I'm going to build a business, or I just need enough to survive. It all comes back to receiving and being and feeling worthy of receiving and taking up more space and having more. And I know we are nurturers by nature. I know this. I know this. I am one too. So if your why and your motivation isn't for yourself, I'm telling you right now, you are probably the most unselfish person I'd ever meet. So how about, how about we receive more so that we can give more? This is literally how we are going to change the world. So run towards books and people and messages like this. All right. You've heard enough of me ranting and raving. Let's dive in. This is Rachel Rogers. Okay, I hit record. Welcome, Let's Rachel. Let's do it. Welcome. <laughs> I knew I had to hit record because we were having a really good conversation. And sometimes it's like, we got to capture everything. That's modern technology. You can't have a yes. conversation without capturing it. It's true. Exactly. So for those who can see, I'm holding up your book, We Should All Be Millionaires. How does it feel? This is an advanced reader copy. You said you haven't even touched it yet. It's a little surreal, Mm -hmm. honestly. So yeah, it'll be interesting. When that box comes, I'm sure I'll just sit on the floor and cry. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Just because the labor of love that it is, it is so much work. It takes so long. There's so much imposter syndrome along the way. There's both like the fear that no one's going to read it. And then there's the, the fear that everyone's going to read it and know all your business that you decided to share the book. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) Yep. It's uncomfortable to put, 
your work out into the world. But I was telling you before we hit record the impact that you've made on my life personally, just by showing up as you and also speaking the truth and the message that you feel called uh, to speak in the world and how that has helped me. Um, with, I don't even want to say the little interaction I've had with you, but like just watching your stuff and watching how you show up, how you run a business and also the stand that you take, uh, for women. So I just wanted to say, thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you for, for watching and absorbing. And I mean, that's what it's all about, right? Like it gives us purpose to know that our work, you know, it's one thing that you could have all these people buy your stuff, but if they're not impacted by it, it's, it feels empty. So that means yeah. a lot to me. So thank you. So I know we're good. I will definitely go into the book, but why don't we just talk about imposter syndrome a little bit? Because yes, you just said you have it. I have it too. I think everyone has it, but also tying that to the bigger why, because, you know, they always say, know your why, know your why, but when you know you're, there's this bigger purpose. So can you talk a little bit about maybe your process um, or what you see when there's something inside of you getting that out into the world, even though it scares you. Yeah. I think it's just taking one courageous step, you know, it's, and also doing what you feel compelled to do, even if it feels unpopular or it feels scary. And I like, I like, <laughs> I negotiate with myself a lot in my head, you know, so, and I've been doing this. I remember doing this when I was you know, 19 and I was leaving home for the first time and I was going to intern for Hillary Clinton, uh, which was a really big deal and a real big opportunity. But I was actually realized I was terrified to leave home Mm. and live somewhere else. So I lived in New York, right? That's where I grew up in Queens and lived with my mom. And I had to leave my home and take a train down to DC and like live with strangers that I didn't know to do this internship opportunity, which completely like it changed the trajectory of my life. So it was like a huge opportunity. It's like, that's how it always is, right? This is going to be huge. And we're terrified and we're like, maybe not. And so my mom says, I remember being literally in the shower, like crying and being like, I don't want to go. Like, I'm finally ready to admit it. I've been thinking it this whole time leading up to it. And I'm supposed to leave like tomorrow. And I'm like, I don't really want to go. I'm scared, you know? And I'm like in my shower crying. And my mom says to me, she goes, she's like holding the shower curtain open, talking to me. (laughs) And she's like, listen, go down there tomorrow. If you hate it, you can come home. Yeah. And I was like, you're right. And so I use that all the time. I'm like, okay, start down the path of like writing this book proposal and see what comes of it. Maybe it'll be great. Maybe you won't want to do it. You know, Um, I do that constantly. Like just write down what you're thinking and then we'll see, you know, you don't have to put it out there. Right. Or you can, you can, you know, test it. And if it sucks, you can always cancel it. And I do that a lot, even in reality, right? Like if I'm testing a new offer, for example, or, new messaging or something like that. I might do it in a non-committal way, testing new pricing. I'll just tell it to the first customer, just one person and see how they respond or talk to a couple of past clients and just tell them what I'm thinking about doing and get their feedback first, right? Like I do a lot of like, let me just dip my toe in first. And it just helps you to build up that courage and and get braver. It's like, oh, I only have to dip a pinky in (laughs) and like, let me do that first. And if that is not too scary. And that's, you know, not overwhelming. I'll do the rest. Right. So that's how I try to get myself to do things when I'm scared. And of course, the more you do it, the more you build up that courage and that bravery where it becomes easier and easier to be courageous. Um, and it takes, it's, you know, you still have fear, but you don't have the, you know, debilitating terror that you might've had years ago when you were first starting to put yourself out there, you know? Um, so those are some of the things that I do But in terms of the connection to the why, I think that's so crucial because, you know, when I was building my business, I had a lot of like, I didn't have any fallback cash, any fallback family member who could take care of me. Like, it was like, I had to make this work. Um, And you know, that was scary. And there were times where I totally wanted to just go back to have a, having a job or whatever. But I think the thing that always keeps me going and always has me taking that next brave step is the overarching why, like the overarching goal. You know, when you are afraid to tell somebody your new prices, you know, like that can stop you. But if you're like, I got kids to feed, 
and I got to do what I got to do. Like, there's no room for fear in that, you know, or if you're like, this mission is so important. I have to get it out into the world. I know I'll never be happy unless I do. That's what happened with that video that came out last June. It was just like, I'm so upset right now that I just have to say what I have to say. And I don't even know why I'm saying it. I don't even know why I'm talking to the people, but I just need to get it out. Otherwise it's going to like become toxic in my body, Mm -hmm. you know? And it's that kind of thing where it's, you know, you just got to get it out and you, you have a why that's greater and that's, what's getting you to do the thing. So sometimes it's that sometimes I just dip my toe in, right. Those are the ways that I sort of get myself to do hard things. (laughs) Love it. Love it. Love it. Um, well, I could take that in so many different directions and you have a lot of stories in your book where you talk about that, right. Dipping your toe in the water, um, and they'll have to read it in order to hear those. But I remember reading a story about you going to the bank um, with yes. a check and you were like, oh, dang, I need that money. I need yes. that money. Okay. Absolutely. I want to read something to you from the intro, which is I knew I was going to read the whole book, literally from the opening line. I believe every woman should want to be a millionaire. If you agree with me, this book is for you. If you strongly disagree with me, this book is definitely for you. Every woman needs to see at least seven zeros in her bank account at the bottom of her own balance sheet um, of her net worth. Every woman needs to know what it feels like to have economic power. That's how we make change. That's how we serve our children. And that's how we serve the world. So people are like, go ahead. I was just going to say that just made me cry for some reason. I don't know why. Mm. I was just hearing it, hearing someone else read it. Yeah. Um, I guess it, it's just that important to me, you know? I love it. Um, <laughs> I'm yes, sorry. I made. Oh, I feel so special when I make people cry. People <laughs> are like Heather, you get your rocks off on making people cry. It's creepy, and I was like, "But you crack open." So I appreciate that because you're bringing all of you to the table to the interview, and um, you know, some people might go, "Yes, yes, yes," but and then everything comes rushing in of why they can't. Yes, totally, yeah. totally. Yeah. Why and is I this think is that's, so important to you? Well, the reason why I love that opening and I love I love that challenge. This book is a challenge, you know, to every woman. Um, because and I like the goal of a million dollars because it feels impossible. I li- mm-hmm. I like it for that reason. Because you know, six figures, you're like, yeah, eventually I'll get there. I'll just keep, you know, slowly whatever. But there's something about becoming a millionaire or seven figures that feels so far off, that feels so not for us, that I'm like, claim it for yourself. Demand it, right? Say that it's yours if you want it, you know? Um, So I, I just, I think it's important to have big, bold goals. And I think bold goals, and I talk about this in the book, are more motivating than sort of ho hum, like, yeah, after a while I'll earn enough to like, buy a nicer car. Cool. But does that get you excited? Does that like make you want to jump out of bed and get to work? No, no one cares about that. (laughs) Maybe if you're my husband, my husband is a car guy. He loves cars. Um, But for most of us, right? Like that's not motivating enough. But like when you think about having a million dollars, you're talking about not enough to get by. And I think that that is what, if there was a way to summarize, it's like, we're doing enough to survive and that's it. Or we have enough to survive and that's it. Like, I mean, the perfect example is look at what's happened in this pandemic to women. You know, it's, it's the perfect example and the proof that we were operating on fumes anyway. And then this pandemic happened and we can't have the support that we're accustomed to just like being able to send our kids to public school. Right. Right. Um, we don't have that support and it's a massive crisis and women are, you know, hundreds of thousands of women leaving the workforce and like can't make it work and are in bad mental shape, you know? Mm -hmm. It's just proof that like we're just, we're just eking by and there's not enough margin. There's not enough room in the day, in, in the bank account and in all the things, right? And so that, that's what this million dollars is about. That's what this million dollar buys you is it buys you space, Okay. So now I'm going to cry because as you're talking, 
I remember when the pandemic hit and I had this feeling of deja vu because I remember being in isolation seven years ago um, when I was in the hospital, didn't even get to see my children. And people are like, how are you doing? Are you okay? Are you immune compromised? It's like, I'm probably healthier than most of you people. Cause I've like <laughs> done things with my health in the last seven years, but I, I had this, like, now everyone's going to know, like, it was almost like, now mm. you're going to know how I felt, but watching, you know, there's something to talk about with this little pyramid. There's like survival mode, momentum, and then it's like thrival. And then this creative, you know, there's like ladders, right? Yes. And I'm like, my health was not even in survival mode. It was in crisis. So I'm like, watch, yes. and I'm watching the headlines, all over the place, like women, 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 moms, this is blah, blah, blah. And even watching some of the newsletters coming in and I'm like, this is so victim mentality. I'm like, yeah, no shit. I'm like whatever was not sustainable, whatever was going on in the world, flashlights are now being pointed, magnifying glasses and people are like, oh, uh. I'm like, you're just feeling it now. It's always there. You just weren't aware mm -hmm. of it. Um, and so and now- our, and, our, and our defense mechanisms for it have been stripped away, right? Like yeah. our ways of coping yeah. are gone. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And it's almost like a good thing because then you're forced to kind of face some of your stuff and hopefully deal with it and resolve it. Yeah. And that's, that's the key is it comes up, you got to feel it comes up and out. Um, I call it emotional poop, but you're also going to grow from, you're going to grow from it too. Place. Emotional poop. It's just, it's got to come up and out, got to come up and out. So there's a lot of trauma there. There's a lot of <laughs> unlearning, you know, on a, on a serious note, there's a lot of unlearning and, uh, money is a big part of that too. So I know you talk about broke ass decisions and million dollar decisions. Is that what you call it? Yes. Yes. So talk a little bit about that. Cause you have a chart in the book and I was like, yes, kind of like you said, you Googled how to be a good parent. And I was like, okay, I'm making most of these million dollar decisions. I'm good. I'm good. Yes. Like, oh, God, I got to work on, I got to work on this one, but, um, <laughs> it's nice to know. We always want to know. So how did you come up with, with this mindset? Because a lot of people are like this or that, do I invest first? What do I do? So do you have stories to tell about broke ass decisions you used to make and how you oh shifted them? Oh my God. Them? So many. So I think it's a broke ass decision to try to do everything alone, which is definitely something that women do. You know, we don't recruit enough help. We don't delegate enough. Um, I think sometimes we do. Um, I, you know, I feel like this might be delegation might be a superpower of single moms in particular, because I, you know, I remember my mom, uh, like calling me from work, like take the chicken out of the freezer, <laughs> put it in the sink to defrost, you know, um, that kind of thing where like, you know, you're, you're get, recruiting some help to get the things that you have to get done, done. But that's really, I, I think what a big piece of this is about. And so, you know, broke ass decisions is like, you know, I will, I need to make this much money first and then I can hire some help. Like then I can get a babysitter to come or like a nanny, um, or, you know, then I'll take care of my health and start going to the gym and eating more organic or whatever, <laughs> eating better. Um, it's always like, after I do this, then that. And I actually think it's the opposite. I think that's the broke ass decision thinking that, you know, if you just keep hustling and working harder, like you are, things are going to change for you and the outcome that you want will come. And I actually think it's the opposite. I think it's making those brave decisions, making those investments of time, money, energy before you have it based on faith, right? Um, that's where you actually see the output. So for example, something that I always tell my clients to do is like hire a personal assistant. And even something easier than that, outsource laundry, right? And when I say hire a personal assistant, I mean, find a college student for five hours a week to say, take some of these errands and some of these things on your plate off your plate, right? And that is such a radical idea. They're like, that's insane. I can't have a personal assistant. Personal assistants are for rich people and celebrities. And I'm like, no, no, no. They're for you too, right? <laughs> you need help, clearly, <laughs> right? When you just hustle all day, right? You work all day and then you come home and you have your, you know, your second shift at home doing all of the tasks there. And then it's just like all you can do to crash. 
and wake up and do it again. It's that is not a life and that we deserve better than that. So something as simple as outsourcing laundry or those kinds of things, those are million dollar decisions. Million dollar decisions don't have to cost a million dollars. A lot of times they cost very, what they cost is like a mental shift. That's what they cost in most cases. So for example, the choice to, and I literally have clients argue with me about this. (laughs) I was going to say, let's talk about the resistance because it's one to make a decision to now do that. And then it's like, you have to grow into that person. Mm -hmm, Exactly. And that's the point, right? If you have, if you hire a personal assistant and they show up and they're like, okay, what do you want me to do? You have to think of things for them to do. You have to communicate what you need them, what success looks like to get those tasks done. All of that is leadership. All of that is, is helping you to grow as a person, you know, and, and helping you to become a wealthy woman, right? Just being able to think that way, making those decisions Um, and wealthy more than just in money, but like, you know, in time, in joy, in all of those ways. Um, So I think there's a lot of growth that can happen there. In the instance of laundry, so many of my clients, I'm like, if I see you talking about spending your whole weekend doing laundry again, I'm going to lose it. Like outsource it. Like that's the first thing you can outsource. It's like 40 bucks to just send it to like, you know, the laundry service, Mm -hmm. have it come back to you folded. You still got to put it away or you can make your kids put it away. Right. But you know, $40 and you save an entire day. And people are like, but I like doing laundry. No, you don't like, like rest more than you like laundry, right? Like, like your peace of mind, right. That rather than the getting up and the sorting and the, you know, putting it in. I don't even know how laundry works anymore because I haven't done it in like a decade. (laughs) (laughs) I haven't, I can't tell people like, what is your laundry system? I'm like, I can't tell you the last time I did laundry, uh, dishes, like Mm -hmm. just certain things. But I, the mental mind fuck that I have had as a woman, my husband is home he left his corporate job four plus years ago. And then I told him, I said, you, you very, you've become very domesticated, but <laughs> oh my gosh, the guilt of like, I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this. And then not doing it at all. And I'm like, what do I do with myself? Having to consciously create yes. joy moments. Like there's something I call, I teach called energetic time management. I have to physically sit there and like plan and put it on my calendar. You're going to have all this white space, Heather, you're not going to sit there and scroll on your phone. What are you going to do that's going to get you closer to like expanding, feeling better? I have to make yes. freaking appointments with myself. Exactly. And when you have space, right, then you have opportunity to work through things. You have yeah. opportunity to shift your thoughts. You have opportunity to spend quality time with your kids. That I do that with my children. Like, okay, we have a weekend coming up. What fun activities can I do? And they're not heavy lifting. It's like, Oh, there's this cool sand art thing. Let's spend an hour doing that, you know, Mm -hmm. and then we'll eat cupcakes. Yay. That was fun. And then maybe we'll watch a movie together or whatever. Right. We have a hot tub. We'll go get in the hot tub together. You know, like I make plans for things like that. And that is a better use of my time than, than doing the laundry when I can outsource it to a company that can do it better than I can anyway. Mm -hmm. And I get that weekend back and then you get to rest. And then on Monday you show up ready to slay you know, yeah. instead of dragging ass, you know, <laughs> love it. And I remember investing in support like this when I, and I'm using air quotes, couldn't afford it because mm-hmm. I actually just prioritized that over getting new shoes or yes. even taking that vacation. And I know people are like, I need my vacations. I need my lifestyle. I'm like, you can't, And I I don't like the terminology sacrifice. I'm like, again, I had to focus on the bigger picture, the bigger why. I'm like, I'll spend this few hundred dollars now. We'll take it out of, we're not going on that little weekend getaway. Why? Because we're going to be able to go on so many more Mm -hmm. in a few years if we, if we do this now. So how do you get people out of that mindset? Yeah. I mean, honestly, I think you can, you can have your vacations. You can outsource your laundry. Like you, the shifts that will happen and the growth that you'll experience, especially of your income, when you start not being responsible for everything, when you start putting boundaries in place and saying, I'm not making dinner every night, I will make it twice a week and y'all are welcome to make it the other days or eat cereal. Frankly, (laughs) I'm here running a business and I'm building a business and I can't, I'm building my income for us, you know? And so I'm not going to be responsible for everything. So something's going to have to give. Y'all are going to have to step up and help. And I tell my kids too, like, hey, 
mommy is working so that you can, you know, have that amazing teacher that's homeschooling you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so that we can live in this nice home. So we, you know, we have horses, which is not a normal thing, but, you know, so we can have some of the things that we have and the experiences that we have. And you got to be on board with that too. I need your help as well. And that means entertaining yourself right now while I'm finishing up work, you know? And that also doesn't mean you working from sunrise to sunset, Mm -hmm. Exactly. It's a, it's a negotiation. And then, you know, it's like with my daughter, I have these conversations and she gets it and she's like, mom, you finish up and then we're going to do this fun thing. And I'm like, yes, we are. I can't wait. Like, let me just finish up these last calls and then we're going to do that fun thing. And I have energy for it because I'm not also, as soon as I'm finishing work, making dinner, cleaning up the house, blah, blah, blah. You know, I still got to get my schlep them into like the bath and like make them do their nighttime routine, but I don't have a bunch of chores to do when I finish work. Yeah. And, and that frees up so much mental time. And then you have time to think and you come with amazing ideas and you make more money. And it's, it's that trust and that faith that like, all right, I'm going to spend this money and it's a little bit scary and it feels uncomfortable but I'm going to invest in myself and in my free time and in my mental space. And that's going to pay dividends. And I'm just going to trust that that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And you do have to build up that trust. I think we are so unaccustomed to investing in ourselves. This is not what society tells us to do. Society is like, get out of debt, stop buying lattes, frivolous woman. You know what I mean? Oh, I was reading about that. And you're like, they market, they want you to be there. Mm -hmm. Um, I've highlighted another something else. The game, a game we can win, even though the rules that apply to men don't apply to us. As mm-hmm. women, especially as women of color, we need to wake up to the fact that our rules of playing and winning the game of success aren't the same as a man's. Mm-hmm. Exactly. But yet mentally, it's like, I can do this. I can do this. Let me overcompensate. Let me strong arm it. So how do you win a game? And then you go into more and more of like, we don't even need to play by their rules. We can create our own rules. Exactly. So dig into that. We don't have to have this power trip. I think about even how I run my company, right? My company is built on trust. You know, like I have trust within my employees. I trust that they're going to get things done. I don't need them to punch a clock or give me a to-do list of here's all the things that I got done. It's like that trust and that, and giving them freedom. Hey, here's the project. Here's what success looks like. Do it in the way that you think will get us to that result. This is your area of expertise. You own that, you make that happen. And, um, and then you're rewarded for it. And if you fail, trust me, you're not going to get fired because you failed, right? If you fail, then we'll post more to it. We'll figure out what happened and we'll do better next time, right? Mm. And that's, that's a very different way than I feel like a lot of businesses taught, with, which is about control and power and, you know, taking the lion's share. We do profit sharing. We have a good month. Everybody gets an extra check that the following month, right? <laughs> like, so we close the books for one month, the next month, they're going to see a benefit from having worked hard that previous month or having created those results. And I think those are the kinds of, and this is a preview of what the next book is about. <laughs> it's about building a sustainable company, right? But just things like that, we can do things differently. The thing, the way that we naturally um, tend to relate to each other in a lot of ways, we can bring that into the way we build wealth, you know? And, and the thing is, you know, the reason why men, and when I say men, I'm specifically talking about, you know, cis straight white men, because that's who usually is going to benefit the most from the systems that we have in place. Right. Um, you know, they have wives, right? Like this structure is built for them to have a wife, to take care of all of that for them. Mm -hmm. And then they're going to work and, and, and go and make investments and be powerful. And these are the messages that are sent to men about money. And for women, it's contract for men. It's like expand, you know, like go make things happen, take charge, take risks. Right. And for women, it's like cut coupons and stop buying lattes and shrink yourself and, you know, stop being so frivolous and do less with more. Um, and so I'm like, no, fuck that. We, we can expand as well. And we can do it in a way that works for us. Um, and we don't have to work a full-time job because that's what it's become now. We're still sort of supporting the men the way traditionally it's been done. And there's a ton of studies in the book around proving that that's still true. Um, and yet we still have full-time jobs as well. And that's what happened in my house, household when I was growing up, right? Like my mom did a lot of the household chores. She worked a full-time job just like my dad. What the mm-hmm. fuck? <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? 
know, like yeah. <laughs> it's nuts. So, so, and you know, I think it's really just about women turning towards their money and saying, what are my earning opportunities? Where is my earning potential, right? What are the natural gifts that I have? What is the experience that I have? What can I bring to the table that's different? And how can I, you know, create intellectual property or use my creativity to build wealth? Um, And we need to do that. We need to have those conversations. We need to focus on that. We need to stop being like, let me support my man in his career and forget about my own. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a broke ass decision to be, you know, making shit happen for your boyfriend or your husband or whoever your partner is and not doing it for yourself. Right. Like, no, we're done with that. (laughs) We need to do things differently. (laughs) Yeah. And they can do their thing. You can do your thing. And you You can be mutually supportive. You can be mutually supportive, but it's not let me sacrifice my wealth building opportunities to, you know, prop up yours, you know? Um, so, so I was going to say, you probably get a lot of pushback, maybe, maybe not of women who are wanting to build wealth and getting a little something from their male counterparts of lack of support or, you know, mm-hmm. feeling that the power is shifting when, you know, she just wants to make, she's excited about it. It's a desire for her. So how does somebody, um, continue to pursue their dreams to go after what they want when they feel like they're not being supported by, um, their partners? Yes. There's actually a script in the book, like a negotiation tool (laughs) for how to talk to your partner about the moves that you want to make, um, to help you build wealth. And the bottom line is, is we don't need permission and we need to let this idea of we need permission I didn't hear that. Go. What did you say? What did you we say? We do not, we do <laughs> not need permission from anyone, you know, not our mothers, not our partners, not our children. We are adults and we can make the choices that we want to make and that we think are best for ourselves and our loved ones. And that's, that's the thing about women. We're always going to make choices that are best for the community. You know, that tends to be you know, the way that we move through the world, right? Like we're less likely and there's stats to support this, that we're less likely to make decisions that are solely for our own benefit. We can all afford to be more selfish, I think, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, as a people. And of course, go ahead. Sorry, I I was just going to say this is, you know, it's generalizing a bit. I'm sure there's some horrible, selfish woman out there, but for the most part, we can all afford to, you know, serve ourselves a little bit more. I also think if you think you're selfish, you're probably not, Mm -hmm. Um, but it's like re-evaluating what you perceive to be selfish. If I'm doing something, I'm like, how is this taking away from anybody else? And it's not, it never is because I'm doing it to better my family, to better myself, to better how I lead. And I'm like, explain to me how that's selfish. I actually think it's a form. I'm like, oh, don't say that. I'm like, I, I could believe it could be a a small form of child abuse. This like Mm. this conversation that women are having of, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. It's abusive. It's abusive towards ourselves. It's abusive towards our family. You know, there's horrible things that even if we are educated, things that we're not like proud of ourselves, of how we've showed up when we're stressed out, when we're burnt out, when we're afraid that there's not enough money exactly. in the bank. We don't know how we're going to pay the bills. You know, how do you react? Um, I know I've had many moments in my early days, especially when I was working with families and then I'd come home and yell and, and then look my children in the eye crying and saying, do ne- never, never let somebody talk to you like that. And I am sorry. And I'm going to figure this out. And, um, if I would have just put myself on the calendar and held that space for myself, I don't see how that's selfish. Exactly. It's not. And also think about like, how do you want your children to be? Do you want your children to grow up to think that they can never put time on the calendar for themselves, that they can never put themselves first and have to prioritize everyone else, yeah. you know, or, you know, for boys to think that they're, they need to just acquire women who will do everything for them. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. um, I want to model for my children, creating a career that works for me, creating a life that I love, 
you know, I want them to see me going out and doing the things that I would hope that they will do one day. And so I don't want to model for them that my whole life, you know, when people are like, oh, you know, my children, they're my whole world. And I'm like, bullshit. My children are not my whole world. They are a very important part of my world, but they are not all of it. And also, I don't want to put that pressure on them. Like all my joy can't come from them. They can't be responsible for my joy. You know, Mm, that has to be my own responsibility. I have to make that happen for myself. That's not something that anyone outside of me can be responsible for. So that's what I want to model for my children. And I think if you don't create the life that you want for yourself, it's like you've got this regret and it creates a tension. And I've experienced this with, you know, my own relationship with my mother, you know, Um, if you don't go and pursue the things like then do you make motherhood was the reason why you couldn't. Yeah. And then how does that affect your relationship with your children, especially as they get older? So I think we need to reevaluate some of these messages that we've gotten because a lot of this is, you know, gleaned from society, right? It's taught to us. This is how you behave. Oh, it's the mommy wars. You know, uh, I'm going to come to the, you know, birthday party with like the best cupcakes and the most over the top, you know, thing. And like, it's just, no, I don't want to fight in this war. No, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Why do women actually need to stop fighting and become allies? Well, because we need each other, right? You need a squad a hundred percent. Um, and that's what, there's a whole chapter in the book called million dollar squad, because if you want to make success easier for yourself, all you need to do is get a squad of people who are, who are for you, who yeah. can support you and you can support them. And it's amazing. I mean, the stats show that like 95% of your success in any pursuit depends upon who you are surrounded by. You know, there are studies of uh, college students that if they hang out with, and this is not necessarily they chose their friends based on their grades, right? They don't. But if they happen to hang out with people who are getting good grades, their grades go up. And if they happen to hang out with people who are getting lower grades, their grades go down. We are so affected by the people around us. Like we can't block ourselves, shield ourselves from other people's energy. And I think that if, when you have that squad, like I have my squad on group chat every day, we're like talking to each other, pumping each other up, giving each other pep talks, talking through challenges, right? that makes a world of difference and it is a huge part of the formula for success. And I think we really underestimate it. So like that woman over there, she's not your competition. Like that woman over there is a member of your squad. You can support her and she can support you. And there's really enough for everybody. There's no reason to be competitive. And this whole bullshit about women competing with each other, I think it's manufactured. I don't actually think we operate that way. I think that's what the media shows us constantly is, you know, girl fight. Let's pull each other's hair and all kinds of bullshit. It's, it's so whack. I've witnessed, and I know you have too, because you talk about it in the book about, I think it was the 10K challenge in your membership um, group that you did, which is a perfect example of what is possible when we come together. But I've gained so much value from women who are like, how can I be of service to you? What do you need? Here you go. Here's a resource. Here's this. No strings attached. And then they come back or you see that they need something and you're like, I got you. Here you go. Here you go. Um, is priceless. You can't even put value or a dollar amount on that. You cannot. I mean, I have certain friends that will speak my name in rooms and I don't even know what's happening. And I could be having the worst day or having a really hard time or period in my business. And then the next thing you know, I get a call from my friend, you know, who's like, do you want to be on the Drew Barrymore show next week? (laughs) And I'm like, what? (laughs) Shout out to Lovey. Um, Lovey and Jai Jones who made that happen, right? And that's just one friend who thought of me when there was an opportunity and she brought me along as part of that. And in fact, she has a regular segment on the Drew Barrymore show now where she is bringing other women on to be like, here's somebody you need to know. Like, you know, share the mic. Um, And it's beautiful. And, you know, I think there's so much of that going on and you just need to get plugged in and connect with other women and really, you know, be valuable to them and, and, and they'll be valuable to you as well. And not just in a transactional way, in a shoulder to cry on way, in a like, how are you doing way, you know, or here's a tip I did. Let me tell you one of the best tips I got from a girlfriend years ago that was life changing when I had my, my, my last child um, night nurse. I didn't mm. know that was a thing. I had never heard of it. Never heard of it. Didn't know it was a thing. Didn't know it was a thing that regular people could potentially afford. 
we were able to hire a night nurse and it was like $20 an hour. And it was like an actual nurse and yeah. they take these extra shifts, you know, cause they work like three days a week for like longer hours. And then they have like four days off. And so they'll fill it in by staying up with your baby overnight. So she would come at 9 PM, you know, put my baby to sleep. She would nap, you know, and then the baby would wake up. She'd bring him to me. I'd nurse him. She'd take him back. So you don't have to get out of bed. You don't have to change them, get them back to sleep. She did all of that. And then she would leave at 6 a.m. And she came three times a week, like every other day. So like I was never, you know, not getting enough rest for more than two days, right? For more than a day, basically. Um, And it was life-changing. It wasn't that expensive. Like it was totally, I could sacrifice something else and pay for that kind of thing. Well, we always I get so excited when you're talking and cut you off. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. No, it was just, it was just a conversation with a friend to know that that's even a thing that people yeah. do and that's, it's possible and how to Google it and how to find it. And, and even permission. Yes, you should do this. You, yes, you need your sleep. You know, you have a newborn, but you don't have to be miserable because you have a newborn, right? Yeah. Like there's, there's support. There's different, you know, another example is the snoo. I'm obsessed with the snoo. If y'all don't know about the snoo and you're having a baby or you got a baby younger than six months, I don't, need know. A snoo. I don't know the snoo. What's oh the my snoo? God. It's like the automatic bassinet that will like your baby wakes up in the middle of the night and it just starts rocking your baby. Ah. It is life changing. Like it is game changer. I mean, that is a product that was made to benefit women in my opinion. <laughs> Dang. Things have changed so much. My youngest is eight. My yes. oldest is 16. I, yeah, baby items have come a long way since then. Oh, they sure have. I mean, the, the noise machines, all the things I, I, I have, my oldest is nine. Um, well, and I have a 21 year old who's my stepdaughter, but you know, uh, I didn't have those things with my, my older two. And then with the little one, I was like, there's a what? Yeah, we need that. (laughs) And it was a girlfriend who made me buy it. I was like, I don't know if I need that. This is like, you know, this is my fourth child. Like I'm fine. And she's like, you must, I demand that you buy this. And I'm like, you don't, I'm shipping one to your house. So stop it. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's always what you think, what you want. And then what you, what you really need. Yes, right? exactly. Yeah. You're like, I need this. I need, I need a new website. It's like, no, you don't. You need to learn like how to sell. <laughs> yes, exactly. You need to get a customer too. How about yeah. that? Yeah. Forget have uncomfortable conversations. <laughs> um, and then as I'm thinking, as I'm, as you're talking, I'm like, and that's also a business that a woman can start as a night nurse. If she is that something mm-hmm. that brings her joy, and she has the capacity for that. But you're like, yes. I need to make extra money. I'm like, this is your passion. It brings you joy. You don't even have to talk. You talk to babies all day. You don't even have to talk to the parents. Exactly. You talk to an angel for like five minutes. She'd walk in the door. I'd be like, here you go. Her name was Rhonda. I was like, you are my favorite person in the world. (laughs) I just wanted to hug her every day. And it was a woman owned company and she was, you know, she was a nurse and she had this army of nurses and she like placed them and they were so in demand. Like she was hiring nurses in droves because they had so many people who wanted this help. It was, and they did daytime stuff too. Like they would help out during the day if you wanted. I was like, I'm good during the day. I just, I just need to get some sleep, please. Yeah. Yeah. Me. <laughs> Such a game changer because sleep is going to impact your relationships. It's going to impact how you're doing your work. You're going to be able to focus, make more money, make a bigger impact. Let's talk oh, can about, we, wait, can we just yes. stop for a minute and talk about sleep? <laughs> Let's talk about sleep. 5am club. Listen, sleep is absolutely, I am very hardcore serious about my sleep. I need a good seven hours every night minimum and I will cancel things if I can't get my sleep. You know what I mean? And I work up, out in the morning and I get up at like six and not 5 a.m. There was a I know time I was joking life. where I was like, you gotta wait. If you don't wake up at five, you <laughs> failed as an entrepreneur. <laughs> oh my God, because of the pandemic, I stopped having to commute my kids to school. We started getting up at eight. I was like, what is this life? You know, Uh, that's shifted a little bit now. And now I get up at like 630, somewhere in there um, and work out and do my morning routine that works for me. But sleep is so essential. Like y'all got to stop staying. And you know what? Nurture yourself. You know how with babies, we're like, let me rock you. Let me put on the noise machine. Let me read you a story. It's like, how about we do that with ourselves? Like, how about we 
take a nice hot bath and then read a book and make it quiet and make the lighting just so and like put more effort into our own sleep routine, right? Like the same way we do for our babies, let's do it for ourselves. And when I started doing that, like, cause I'm not somebody, I'm so intense and like my brain is always going, it's hard to turn it off. And so you have to put the phone down and oh. I read a novel that I get yeah. wrapped up in. I mean, I'm three pages in and I'm knocked out, <laughs> you know? <laughs> It takes me forever to get through a novel that I'm reading at night. <laughs> I always... But it's so it makes a big, big difference. I know. And it's getting... It's really getting electronics out of the room. That's you... For sure. You cannot... And the excuse that you use your cell phone as the alarm clock. It, great. Either put it off in another room, get one of those little sunlights, do something. I'll go buy a $10 cheap alarm clock. Exactly. Amazon or your local store, do whatever you need to do. You don't need to use your cell phone. It's you got to break these patterns and these habits. Exactly. And what we're talking about here is just effort. Like what you want is just going to require a little bit of effort and like basically point it at yourself. Yeah. We effort so hard for everybody in our lives and not for ourselves. It's like, yeah, yeah. Put some effort in just for you. Yeah. You know? just for your own benefit. That's it. Do a little research, find your alarm clock, whatever you got to do, change your routine. And the thing is these habits become so ingrained that you can't not do it. It's like the habit supports your laziness, right? (laughs) Like, Mm -hmm. you know, even like brushing my teeth at night, I can't get in my bed now without it. And I used to be somebody who didn't do that on a regular basis. And now what I do, this is my, like my favorite life hack that I like to share with people. (laughs) kind of dumb, but I eat dinner at like five 36. Like I eat dinner pretty early. And right after dinner, I go brush my teeth Mm. because I don't want to wait till I'm falling asleep on the couch or like I'm tired in bed and be like, Oh, right. I got to go get myself up now and go brush my teeth. Cause now that I'm sleepy, I want to go right to sleep. So that's my hack. And it also prevents me from eating like nonsense late at night that I don't even want, you know, or need. Um, so I brush my teeth and then I'm like, nope, I'm not eating that. Cause I'm not brushing my teeth again. <laughs> love it. I got into a chip. I love that hack. I got into a chip, um, addiction during the pre early days of COVID. And I was like, oh, I, can't, yeah. I can't do this. I felt like crap. And then I really started to clean things up. I have, um, yeah, I have, I'm like 45 days sober of chips. I actually put a sobriety app on my phone. People laugh at me, but I'm like, this is oh, really listen. bad. This is I respect bad. the effort that you're putting in though, to like stop that. Cause I did my, my early pandemic, uh, drug of choice was cheese doodles. Mm. I'm like, I haven't eaten cheese doodles since I was like nine. Right? Like when I was a little kid, I used to eat them. I didn't really eat them as an adult. And like, it was a pandemic. I got cheese noodles one day. And then I was like, that's it. Yeah. It's like me on the couch with the cheese. Noodles. <laughs> and I'm like, this is not a good coping mechanism. <laughs> I gotta find but it. I, I like, I was sick. You know how you're just like, I am kind of like just annoyed with myself. Like, yeah. I don't even want these. I don't like that. I feel out of control with the cheese noodles. Like they have control over me, you know? And you know that if it's going in and you're like, no, not this. I'm like, this is way beyond the chips. This is not like me restricting anything. Cause then I'm the rebel. I'm like, don't take my chips away. I'm like, no, this is not about the chips. There's something more here. So I'm like, until I feel like I can manage this in a healthy manner, uh, uh-uh, I'm, I'm doing it. So now I put a little square of chocolate and I like rub it on my tongue and I just like mindfully eat this thing. My husband's like, you are nuts. I'm like, I don't know what's going on with my body, but we have to be honest with ourselves that there's a lot going on Mm -hmm. and we can change our behavior, but we just have to be consciously aware of it. It doesn't have to be perfect. Yeah. And I just want to be clear too. I don't give a shit about weight. Like I could care less, you know, I'm not a small woman and I'm not trying to be, um, but I don't like feeling like impulsive. Like I can't, I'm impulsively, you know, consuming things that don't serve me. It doesn't feel good. Like that's what it's about. It's about feeling like you're out of control with food or or with anything, you know, I don't want to feel that way. Um, And so that's why I, you know, had, I had to handle it. And basically what I found too, which is, you know, uh, something that I really learned from my friend, Susan Hyatt, who wrote a book called Bear, she talks about pleasure and like we, we as women don't have enough pleasure in our life. And that's why we're impulsive. I mean, it was a pandemic. So 
of course we didn't have pleasure during this time, but like we, you know, are eating sugar or, you know, whatever, all these habits that we have that don't serve us and that we don't enjoy, we're doing it because we don't have pleasure. There's a lack there. And it's like, how can we get back to pleasure and enjoying ourselves and delighting ourselves and doing things for the sole sake of it delights me to do it? You know, I really appreciate you saying that. I got to a point where I'm like, how does this feel? Cause I'm, how does this feel? How does this feel? And I'm like, I feel like shit. So then I reframed, I, cause I used to say, I deserve chips. I deserve chips. I'm like, I deserve to feel like shit. And then that was my aha moment where I was like, Mm. why do I feel like I deserve to feel like shit? Because I think going back to the book, wealth, more, attraction, receiving is actually incredibly uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Yes. So feeling good is, is a skill. Yes. And allowing it in is a skill, whether it's food, money, you know, abundance, healthy relationships, receiving support, all of that. Absolutely. We're so accustomed to, and for some of us addicted to the struggle yeah. That the idea of not struggling is so foreign and, and we will fight it. My, my, my clients will be like, I can't have someone else handling my underwear. I'm like, that's more important to you than like rest, than sleep, than enjoying your life, than having more pleasure. Like, fuck, who cares? Somebody's handling your underwear. Trust me, they ain't doing nothing weird with it. And even if they are, you don't know about it. So who cares? Don't even worry about it. <laughs> you know, they come back clean. That's all you need to know. Yeah. <laughs> But don't give them your underwear. Just like keep by, like start with everything else, start doing your own undies and then it just ease into it. Ease into yes, it. Yes, exactly. Exactly. As soon as that laundry comes back folded the first time, most people are like, uh, yeah, here's everything. There you go. <laughs> here's my linens. Here's the things I felt precious about. I don't care anymore. You know? <laughs> yeah. Here's my children. Just go do it all. Um, okay. I feel like I'm looking at time. We could be talking forever and ever. And there was other things I wanted to ask you, but they're just going to have to get the book. So where and when can everybody get, we should all be millionaires. And what else do you have coming up as well to help them step into their power? Yeah. Well, you can get the book wherever books are sold. So all over the world, it's, it's, it's available for pre-order. Um, and it will be, um, in your hands on May 4th. That is, awesome. that is pub day quickly approaching. Very exciting. So, um, we encourage you to do that and we're doing a fun, we should all be millionaires live 14 day coaching intensive. So those who want to pre-order the book, if you go to hello slash book, um, you can pre-order it and you'll get a fun two week coaching session, uh, coaching package with me. Awesome. And Instagram and podcast. What's so I'm on Instagram at Rach Rogers ESQ. Don't forget DG, not just G. People misspell it. People, you can spell Rachel and Rogers two different ways. And it's like bane of my existence. <laughs> so Rach Rogers ESQ on Instagram and Twitter. That's where you can find me. And our website is hello7.co. Join our mailing list. You'll get, you'll get little pep talks from me every week. Thank you, Rachel. We should all be millionaires. Go get your copy for those watching this. There you go. There you go. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you.